All right, thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, today we're here with an, our, an episode of our Authors Forum, uh, here today with Edward Braun, who uh, has written a great book uh, called Finance Behind the Veil of Money, which is available for Liberty Me, Liberty Me members. Uh, Edward, Edward Braun uh, received his doctorate in economics at the University of Angers in France uh, under the direction of uh, Guido Holzmann. And he worked as a research assistant at the University of Passau in Germany and was a summer fellow at the uh, Mises Institute in Auburn, Alabama. And he currently holds a postdoctorate position at the Klostal University of Technology in Germany. Uh, the book is a, it, it, it's got a huge scope. It uh, relies on sources from three languages and delves deeply into the history of capital theory and covers a variety of topics, uh, in particular uh, the history of the subsistence fund theory and on the relationship between monetary theory and capital theory, on economics and business accounting, on price theory and interest theory, on financial markets, business cycle theory, and economic history. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Edward. Now, thank you, Matt. Hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to present my book, Finance Behind the Veil of Money, to you. And as Matt said, it was written during my time as a PhD student at the University of Angers in France under the direction of Professor Guido Hülsmann. And I would like to begin by saying that it was for me a privilege to be able to focus my attention on Austrian economics and on this topic, the financial market in particular, for four years there at Angers. And I think um, that the at least the, the pleasure that I had in writing the book can be seen in it because it contains what was my interest all the time. I was able to write exactly what I wanted to write, uh, thanks to Professor Guido Hussmann, who uh, let me all the freedom that I wanted and needed. And this was a very great experience. Now what I do in this book is I try to write a Austrian theory of the financial market, uh, to, to uh, write about the role of the financial market in the economy from an Austrian point of view. And of course, there has been a lot of work by Austrian economists about things that are related to the financial markets. There's a lot of work on monetary theory, and there's a lot of work on capital theory and of course both money and capital are connected, the topics are connected to the question of the uh, financial market, but of course money and capital also exist outside of the financial market. So they are connected but of course the theory of money and the theory of capital are not themselves a theory of the financial markets, and that's what I tried to do. I wanted to find out what is special about the institution of the financial market. Now, in the beginning, of course, of writing the book, I had a look at the literature, and in the literature there are basically two approaches to the financial markets. In the first approach, it is said that the financial markets are basically about the de determination of the interest rate. This is mainly done in Keynesian macroeconomics, where the uh, interest rate influences uh, investment spending and export spending, and thus uh, influences aggregate demand. This is the first view of the financial market, that, it, uh, that its role is to determine the interest rate. And the second view 
or the second approach is that the financial market is basically about the allocation of resources. It is a function of the financial market to allocate the resources to the different places in the economy. Um, and this approach for me was the more interesting one, but it has the following problem. It says that uh, the resources of the economy are allocated by the financial markets, but what are these resources? Uh, there are a couple of synonyms which are used, so these guys also they say that the financial market allocates capital, it allocates goods or allocates money, but all these terms are thrown together and they are never really explained. What are these resources or what is capital in this case? Uh, especially it's not answered, what are these resources and how do they relate to the money flows on the financial markets that you can observe on the financial markets. And this was my research question, the basic research question. Are there flows of real goods that can be associated with the cash flows that can be observed on the financial market? That is the basic question that I posed and that I tried to answer. And of course, in order to answer this question, I had to find a connection between capital theory and monetary theory, between these two blocks. Uh, because on the financial markets, it's very difficult to, to, to distinguish the two. Uh, Money becomes capital on the financial market, but capital also becomes money. And uh, I, in my book, try to make sense out of this all, out of this connection and about uh, and of the institution of the financial market, especially. Now, what is my starting point? My starting point is Richard von Striegel, uh, an Austrian economist who has written in 1934 a book called Capital and Production, and it was translated, I think, in uh, 2000 into English. And Striegel said that the basic requirement for any time consuming production process. The requirement are consumer goods, consumption goods. So he said that any production process can, time consuming production process can exist. The people who participate in this process must be able to consume. They must have uh, consumption goods. And, and he said it is the function of capital to fund this consumption by the people who participate in the production process. And he added that it is a function of the financial market to allocate this consumption or this power to consume. So on the financial markets, uh, in the end, the power to consume is allocated to the different production processes in society. And in order to, to argue this way, of course, he had to find a connection between the financial market and this power to consume. And Striegel argued that the money that is traded on the financial market or money in general is just a claim on consumption goods. So he tried to create a relationship between money and consumption goods. And he also tried to, to create a, uh, a relationship between capital and consumption goods. He said that the free form of capital is nothing else than a fund of consumption goods, or he called it a subsistence fund. Now, Striegel only 
states these points. He does not provide any argument or a proof. He just says money is a claim on consumption goods and capital, free capital, is nothing else than a subsistence fund. But uh, he doesn't elaborate on this. He just states it. And this is what I consider one or the central contribution of my book. Um, I substantiate these points by uh, Richard von Striegel. So I show that there is indeed a close relationship between the purchasing power of money and consumption goods. Um, how this is a very, I think it's a quite complicated argument. I only want to indicate how I try to show that there's a close connection. Now, there are basically two different kinds of transactions where money is involved. On the one hand, there are business transactions, which means transactions between different entrepreneurs or different businesses. And in these transactions, no preferences are involved. And there's a different kind of transactions uh, where preferences are indeed involved. Uh, so when a consumer buys a consumer good, then of course he has preferences for this good. And also when a laborer sells his labor to an employer, there are also preferences involved, at least to, uh, to leisure. And I argue that these kinds of transactions where preferences are involved are the important ones. These transactions between money and consumer's goods and leisure are the transactions where the purchasing power of money is determined. This is so because in these transactions there is a trade-off. The people who buy consumer's goods or sell their labor have to trade off between money and the consumption goods they want and there are their preferences involved and it, it depends on their preferences whether they do it whether they buy or don't buy and therefore in these transactions a relationship is established between money and these goods that are traded the consumption goods now in um, the other kind of transactions, the business transactions, they completely depend on the transactions uh, where preferences are involved. They don't stand, do not stand on their own. They are derived transactions, and the relationships between money and the goods that are traded there are derived, derived relationships. The reason is that in these kinds of transactions between entrepreneurs, where only entrepreneurs are involved, in these transactions there's no trade-off. Entrepreneurs do not have to trade off between the goods they're trading in, between uh, machines and money or tools and money. They don't have preferences for these kinds of goods. They aren't interested in these goods themselves, they are only interest, interested in their profit, of course, and in this they completely depend on the transactions that are uh, performed in the other sphere, or they, consume, uh, they depend on the uh, transactions where preferences are involved. Without them, they couldn't sell anything for profit in the end to the consumer. And also, um, maybe they couldn't purchase laborers because eventually, or maybe some laborers won't work for money. Uh, I don't know whether I brought, could bring this point across 
I only try here to, to indicate uh, the way of my argumentation. Um, so, this is um, the main point uh, about the purchasing power of money, that there's a close relationship between uh, money and consumers' goods. And what I do, of course, in order to get a connection to the financial market, is also to show that capital theory can be based on these results, can be based on the fact that the purchasing power of money is closely connected to uh, consumers' goods. Uh, now, concerning the real capital theory, or concerning the capital theory which regards capital as capital goods, this has already done more or less by Richard von Striegel. He showed that the structure of production, the different stages of production, depend on the existence of uh, a fund of means of subsistence, of the subsistence fund of consumers' goods. And he thus uh, provided a connection between uh, consumers' goods and capital from the real point of view. And what I add in my book is uh, a connection between capital in the sense of private capital, or business capital, where capital is all about monetary calculation, with consumers' goods or with the power to consume. And uh, I don't want to go into this. Um, as long as monetary calculation and capital accounting is based on the traditional accounting principles, the principle of uh, the realization of revenues and the principle of lower of cost or market. As long as capital accounting is based on these principles, then one can show that entrepreneurs in their monetary calculation indeed calculate in, term, in terms of the power uh, to consume, in terms of the power to fund people in production. So, to sum up, what I try to do is to connect capital theory and monetary theory, and I do this on the basis of uh, the approach of Richard von Striegel, and I try um, to, to uh, explain the role of the financial market based on these foundations. So, um, when it is said the financial market allocates resources or allocates capital or allocates money, in my opinion what is meant is that the financial market allocate, allocates the power to consume or allocates the subsistence fund or the means of subsistence to the different areas, to the different production processes in the economy. Now, I uh, only uh, presented one central point of my book. I also go a little bit into interest theory. I have a praxeological theory of interest, and I also have an empirical chapter on the um, financial crisis of 1873, which um, shows There's a lot of parallels to the present crisis, and where can I, where I can uh, employ my theory pretty well, but uh, these are details, and I don't want to go into them. And, uh, I think we will have a Q and A following. Where you can post questions. I, I'm sorry, I, I think I took that. Would you like to go ahead and start the Q&A, or did you have more to say? Sorry. No, it's, uh, I would like to open the Q&A section. 
All right, um, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, you can ask it in text in the questions tab to the right, or you, if you'd like to come on screen to ask, um, you can click video chatting in the upper right, and then click start your webcam, and I'll be able to bring you on screen. Um, I'll get us started. I, I was looking over the book, and I noticed that you, you go into, as you mentioned, uh, into uh, interest theory just a little bit, and yep. it looks like you have uh, a little bit of uh, critique of uh, Professor Hulsman's uh, theory of interest. Uh, could you go yep. into that just a little bit? Okay, yes. Um, now, first of all, I do not only criticize him, um, but I start, I more or less start my discussion of uh, the Brexiological Brexit Theory of Interest from his article on interest theory. So I basically agree with him uh, and I basically uh, share his criticism of Mises' interest theory where he employs a time preference. Um, there's um, one difference between uh, Professor Hülsmann's theory and my theory. He says that uh, originary interest is the value difference between means and ends. Um, and I say that means and ends are the wrong category categories used uh, in this uh, context. They are, as I uh, call them, technical terms, means and ends, what you have to, to uh, look at are costs and revenues. In action, you have costs and you have revenues or psychic costs and psychic revenues and these are the two magnitudes that you have to relate to each other and there is indeed a uh, value spread between the two and it's the originary one and this is the difference between um, Professor Hülsmann and uh, myself. And how would you boil down the difference between uh, you know, the theories of uh, your theory and Professor Hülsmann's theory and uh, the theory of Mises? All three. Or between Mises' theory and uh, Professor Hülsmann's and mine theory. Could you uh, uh, because be bet between uh, well, I guess uh, between your theory and Mises, and I guess uh, you you've explained between yours and Hulsman's. Okay, this would take me a lot of time. Uh, yeah, so that's a big question. Sorry, it's a difficult. I realize question. that. Uh, the basic critique of the time preference theory uh, that was uh, raised by Professor Hülsmann was that it is, I think he called it a consumption theory of interest. So it is based on the idea that um, all people prefer consumption to non-consumption. So everybody has to consume, and so he prefers the present to the future. If he wants to consume, he has to prefer the present to the future. And uh, Professor Hussmann there says um, that this is that consumption, that people consume is not a praxeological fact. Uh, there are people who do not consume. There are, I don't know how to pronounce it in English, martyrs, people who die on purpose, who, who sacrifice themselves, who do not consume, who abstain from consumption, and these people, these actions could not be reconciled with uh, Mises' 
theory, and therefore it cannot be a praxeological theory. Hmm. All right. Um, all right. You also go into uh, the theory of the business cycle and the German crisis of 1873. Could you uh, say a few words on that and maybe explain just briefly, because this is another big question, lots of big questions. It, it's a, the scope of your book is just massive. Um, but uh, on how it expands our, uh, our understanding as Austrians of, of that crisis. Well, there are two reasons why I was writing about this crisis. The first one is a very pragmatic uh, reason. There has been nothing by Austrians on this crisis, or nearly nothing. So I could uh, provide something new. And the second reason is that back then, the German government had um, established what is called fair value accounting. It's mm -hmm. uh, in, in uh, business accounting and capital accounting. Uh, and they, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, the, the old rules, the old principles, realization principle and law of cost, uh, cost and markets were abolished. And as this aspect is also an aspect of my uh, development, of my argument about capital and money, I chose this crisis. And what you can see in this crisis is uh, that the fact that the corporations employed fair value accounting uh, increased the boom or uh, strengthened the boom and thus consequently also uh, severed uh, the crisis. And this is one aspect of, of the story, uh, the accounting, and uh, the other aspect is more a very conventional one. It's uh, very similar to what should happen according to Austrian uh, business cycle theory. There was an expansion of money and credit uh, up to 1873 and uh, the prices went up, especially the prices of capital goods and after 1873 just the, the development was reversed. All right, uh, well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to getting to delve deeper into the book and I think it's, it's great. So uh, everyone should check it out on Liberty Me. I'm about to link to it in the chat window. And thank you everyone for coming. Uh, thank you, Edward, and uh, congratulations on uh, on passing the, the dissertation board. I read about it on the, the Mises blog, I think. Um, and uh, thank congratulations you. on your new position as well. And thanks so much for coming. Everyone take care. Uh, we've got another session tonight at Let's see, it's 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, it's on Christianity and Libertarianism with Norman Horn. So if you're interested in that, definitely uh, come back tonight. I hope to see you all there. Take care.